talk a bit about product development, and then I'll open it up for Q&A and try to have that like, lead the discussion. Um, to start off with, has anyone outsourced software before? Show of hands. Yeah? OK, cool. Um, so, and if there's, um, there's a couple, there's a lot of things that go around when you think about building software, and uh, there's a few key things uh, that, that matter. And I want to start off with like, someone asked me what's the number one most important thing in building in outsourcing software. Uh, I'll usually say communication. And the reason why communication is so fundamental is because if you don't communicate properly, then no matter how good the developer is, um, the whole thing breaks down. So a lot of the times you'll see people outsource software and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm outsourcing um, some tech, but um, the, they just think they kind of throw what they want over the fence and then it kind of magically gets done by, by a dev team. In reality, uh, there's a lot more iterative, there's a lot more of an iterative process than it is just kind of me throwing uh, a few specs over, over, the, over the fence and telling them to just go out and, and build. Okay, so you're starting to see what was, uh, used to be, you know, we used to think of waterfall, right? Where it's like I have all the specs and I just like build it to an agile process where we're building tech uh, on sprints and during the sprint we're running and then at the end of the sprint you have changes and you go against muscle. So that's kind of the structure of outsourcing software. Now, how do we communicate? Uh, and so people ask, okay, what does that mean, communication? So there's a few things. One, it's like, you know, you have daily stand-up calls and you talk every day, you talk about uh, what people, you know, usually there are three questions you ask. What did you do yesterday? What are you doing today? And what uh, challenges are you facing? And if I have that daily stand-up, I can manage a lot of these issues because I start to see problems as soon as they happen as opposed to two weeks later. Uh, and that kind of ability to foresee problems allows you to better project how things are progressing and allows you to um, start thinking about solutions much earlier on. So those are two key aspects of building salt, of, of building them. And the next, the, the second important thing within communication is you want to have a couple of hours where you're both working at the same time. So whenever you have a remote team, you're managing a remote team, you have, uh, you're in US time zone and they're in Eastern Europe time zone. Eastern Europe is around seven hours ahead of Eastern time and 10 hours ahead of West of Pacific. And so you're trying to say, oh, well, the overlap in working hours isn't that much. You have to ensure that there's a two hour overlap where you're both online, uh, meaning you're both online on Skype, online on any chat system, um, on, on RetroBank, we have our own portal, whatever you're on. Um, you're both online, and it doesn't not necessarily mean that you're con constantly chatting during those two hours, but at least you're both available to communicate. And that ability to quickly get answers solves a lot of the problems, whereas if I send you an email and you don't respond to me in the next day, I've wasted my whole day if that's, a, if that's a problem. Or what I end up doing is I make an assumption. And I make an assumption that's usually wrong, or that you're not 100% on the same page with, and therefore I spend my whole day working on something that you are then unhappy about because I've made an assumption. And what then happens is you're frustrated, and you say, no, this is completely wrong, you just wasted the whole day. The other person is frustrated because they spent the whole day working on something, and now you're telling them it's not good. And so you have to start to see this negative dynamic start to build up. Over time, that creates this like battle, you know, us versus them mentality, which is completely wrong, and that's how you start seeing things break apart. So whenever you're working on remote teams, you really want to think about remote management. Second thing that's important, I'm not going to go too long because I want to, I want to open up the questions. The second thing that's important is screening. So screening is what we spend a lot of our time on uh, because it's extremely important. If you don't screen uh, for talent, you end up getting a whole host of nice problems. Um, so how do you screen? Well, I'll tell you how we screen and uh, that can guide you to thinking about like, how, what's the best way to screen. So there's kind of a four step process in our screening, pro screening process. And, and after that, we have a, a little like test thing that we might do uh, and depending on specific relationship. Um, so the core behind the, the testing process is this. Most people, when they come to ask, uh, when they come to hire uh, a, a technical developer, they will ask them, uh, you know, tell me about yourself and what challenges do you face as a developer and questions like that, which we just see as like common questions to ask developers. Um, in reality, that's not how you would hire. Um, that's not how you would hire someone if it's uh, if, if it's a, if it's a chef, if it's a chef for your wedding or an, a band for your a band you're trying to hire for your wedding. You wouldn't ask them. You know, you wouldn't sit down in uh, a band and ask them, "Tell me about your challenges." Right? You would tell them, "Like, play for me your music. Let me listen to your music." Um, you would ask a chef to. You want them to taste their cake. Okay, and that's a very different approach. 
And uh, in software development, people just don't do that as much. Uh, mainly because it's challenging, like you gotta write an assignment that has to be well, well structured, you have to get them to code that assignment, and it takes up a lot of time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we think it's very important to have that frame of mind when you're approaching hiring a tech person versus the other uh, traditional route, which is, let me ask them about the challenges they face, and then let me ask them really hard algorithm questions that are completely irrelevant to my job. I'm just gonna ask them that because when I go online and I Google it, what to ask developers, they say ask them, some coin algorithm uh, that is not relevant to the job. So algorithms are great if you're hiring someone for machine learning or you're hiring something where algorithms are very important to the job, but like having that be the core thing you're basing an iOS developer on, uh, most of the times is not the, best, uh, is not the best way to hire. So anyway, four step process. All right, one, it's their, uh, we speak a lot with their past clients and you have to ask smart questions to their past clients. So a lot of people will come and be like, oh, um, let me speak with their past client. How was the? How was this developer? They'll be like, oh, it's pretty good. You're like, oh, okay, cool, it's pretty good. And then that's kind of the end of the discussion. Whereas if you ask smart questions, you want to understand how that how that company manages challenge. And if you understand that, you can do a lot of smart things. So you want to understand how they manage challenge, and because every every outsourcing engagement will have ups and downs, right? It's, it's just inevitable. And understanding how that company responds to it is the key. Um, so you want to ask smart questions, client reviews. Then you have the portfolio review. Um, so you want to understand their portfolio of work, and there's a lot of things you want to do with the portfolio of work. Again, asking smart questions about what they've done, what they've built, and seeing any open source code they've done. People are actively contributing to open source. You can actually see the way they write code, and when you see the way they write code, you can start to think about how they're thinking about it. Third is uh, their tools, uh, understanding of tools. So in remote work, there's four key types of tools, and if you speak with a dev team and they don't understand, they might not understand, they, they don't have to think about and like fully study remote tools, but they have to understand at least the variety of tools available and why they've chosen the tool they have for task management, accountability management, um, social communication, collaboration, etc., chatting. Um, so just they have to understand these things and they have to be able to talk about them and tell them. The fourth thing is like their developer profiles and their management team. Who are these guys? What are they doing? And why are they passionate about it? And so what we do, and, 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 and then after that, there's a test. And the, the, after the four steps, there's a test. The test is mainly about we do a screen share, and during the screen share, we can see. Uh, so you have to very intelligently construct the exam, the test, and you do the screen check and you ask them to think aloud as they code, and that gives you just amazing uh, insight into the way they think about code, their experience as a developer, that no question can ask. So it is a half an hour of time, half an hour to an hour of the developer's time to do that, but the amount of information gives me. That's the you know, 10 minute intro to outsourcing. Uh, I can go into a lot of detail on that, but I wanted to start off with that piece, and then talk about the product design and then open it up to questions. Okay. Is there any questions like right now before I move on to product and stuff? You mentioned four types of tools for uh, mm -hmm. what are those tools? Yeah, so there's task management tools, which you think about like how do you manage accountability and how do you think about task management. The second type of tools are chatting tools. Um, so how do you how do you think about chat? Third is video, voice and video collaboration, and then fourth is a social and and cultural remote cultural collaboration. <coughs> So um, half an hour might not be a long enough time um, to gauge uh, with the screen share how someone is at, uh, at programming. Um, in your experience, like having, having done that, how, how representative is a half hour sample? Like obviously they'll be on their best behavior, um, you know, doing their best coding yeah. during that time. How, how representative is that of how they actually turn out? Very well. So within that half an hour to an hour, there are two parts. First part is their technical. Uh, their, their technical knowledge, right? So you're, you tell them, okay, these are test cases that you need to pass. Like these are things that you need to, your code needs to be able to solve these specific issues. And a lot of times people say like, oh, that's the test. But what they don't realize is that really the test is much more, de much deeper than just the actual like, oh, did they, were they able to execute? Was, does this function work? Does it do, does it output what we want it to output given whatever input we give it? That's actually not the main goal of the assignment. Obviously they need to be able to do that. The goal is to see how they're thinking about it. And so the best developers are thinking ahead about other developers, how other developers are going to understand their code, how they write the code, how, they, how, they, how are they commenting. Um, and so you, the way they think about these things are going to give, give, give you guidance. Like, are they thinking about runtime? Are they thinking about, is this the most efficient way to do it? And even if sometimes the best path doesn't take much longer than half an hour to an hour, but if they're talking to you about it, that means they recognize it. And that's a big thing. The second thing is their attitude. Because you're putting small tricks in place that's going to take time for them to do, 
uh, that's not easy to solve. You can see how they manage challenge, right? So uh, how are they searching? You can see them because you're because you're screen sharing them. You can see how they're searching, how they're thinking about it. So you, just from that, you can get a bit of a lot about you get sufficient insight about their attitude and their technical competency that you can't get otherwise. Do I, does it give me a hundred percent signal? Not really, but it gives me. It's the the uh, quality of screening is uh, second to none. Outside of like hiring someone for like five months and training. So it's pretty powerful, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, if they're an angry person who you wouldn't want to work with, they're not going to be like super angry on the on that in that half an hour now. Uh, so yeah, sorry, quick follow up on that consistency there, like commenting code for future people to, to come look at that. You're saying that that's you're suggesting that that's something that it, it, they can't really fake. Like if they do it there, that means that that's just how they. Well, you'll you'll be able to get a sense of their understanding. You wouldn't be able to get a sense of their exact long-term discipline, right? So long-term discipline, you only get that over time. But you'll get a sense of their that, that during that test, how they do. Do if they write like amazing, if they comment clearly and they do things properly during that, does that mean they're gonna do that in the future? It doesn't guarantee it, but at least it tells you that they know how to do it and they know that it matters. If they don't do it, then it's more a matter of discipline than knowledge or ability. Is there any merit to doing offline assessments? I mean, I know you can get a lot of code on like GitHub and stuff, but like, is there any merit at all to giving to outsource developers offline assessments? Like, give them like a couple of days to do a more complex task. Yeah, sure. Um, that that's another thing we've seen uh, some of our companies do when you have more specific tasks. It's if you have one of the things that there's two part two uh, two things I want to talk about. First is. Um, if you have a very specific library that you're using, or a very specific uh, product that you want to test them on, and you want to make sure they have that right experience, then it makes, if, and you want to give them a longer test, then totally go for it. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, the second thing with, uh, with like trying to think about uh, tests is sometimes you'll get someone to come and they're an entrepreneur and they'll be like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not a technical person. How am I supposed to get right a test? Right? And we're like, okay, we've already done that first round of vetting for you. Um, but is there a CTO, like people will have like, oh, I have a CTO who's working part time. Or is there someone who's uh, marginally involved in tech as a tech advisor? Bring that person in and understand their preferences. And if that person is going to potentially be a full time person in the future, and he loves Ruby and wants to be in Ruby, uh, wants, to, wants, to, wants you to code in Ruby, make sure that that's included in your original process. Make sure their styling guidelines and the way they like to write code is incorporated early on. So many times we get companies, they're like six months in and CTO advisor comes in and it's like, I don't like these styling guidelines, I don't like the way they're writing code, I don't like the way they're architecting it, I don't like this, this, this. And six months down the road, it's complete, it's a failure. And that is a communication problem. People don't realize it, but it's a hundred percent communication problem. If that was your tech advisor, why don't you get them in communicating from the beginning? Okay, so why don't you manage styling guidelines? And a lot of the times, like you just you can default to Google has great styling guidelines. You just kind of go with what Google does for, uh, for the languages. But sometimes people have very specific ways of thinking about things or architecting things that you kind of have this, this argument like what is better, uh, you know, this architecture, this architecture, this language or this language. And there's huge debates around it. Um, and it's like, you know, I'll ask you like, what's the right answer? And we'll send them like, these are 100 advantages for this language, 100 disadvantages for this one, 100 advantages, 100 disadvantages for this one. Neither one is absolutely better. There's this, there's this pull and there's this pull and tug. And so, um, you know, Dan Schiffer has a really good analogy. It's like a, he says that like different knives have uh, different applications. You know, if you're cutting butter versus bread and things like that. And so the same for languages. Like it's not like oh, like this this knife that you cut steak with is always better than the butter knife or whatever. It's just that they have different applications and each one has its pluses and minuses. So this whole idea of oh, like this one and, and people will. People will argue for a while about it. It's it's, um, it's not a perfect argument. It's really just like there's a lot of positives and negatives, as there is to everything in life. It's more about. I just follow up. So, what are the biggest reasons that you've seen why people decide to, like change, like go from when you're going from a beta to like a final product to change, totally scrap the code? Like, is it more like runtime efficiency stuff, or is it like a totally different? set of consideration. Yeah, I think there's uh, a few reasons why they do that. One, it's their first product is an MVP and they kind of build it as a hack. So they don't build it for the long term, they build it with the mindset that we just want something to look like it works on the front end, but there's a lot of things we're doing to streamline the way things work. 
um, that is not going to be sustainable or scalable. And we do that on purpose because we're doing it on a low budget and more as a test case. That's one reason. Second reason is change of developer. Um, so as they bring on a lot of, sometimes they just don't have a CTO already on and they're building other tech, they're building in a CTO. CTO wants to, wants to own the process and the CTO realizes that if we keep building on top of this, it's going to go, I'm just going to get more and more frustrated and have to deal with all these problems. It makes sense for me to scrap it. And anyway, it was like a small build. So that's the second reason why they do it. Um, third reason why they do it is just like about the, the, you outsourced and they just did a bunch of mistakes in the way it's been structured. And you're just like, all right, I do not want to manage this. I, I just, I should rebuild it. Yeah. Or, and, and, the, and obviously, of course, the whole idea of like, we just failed. We tested in the market, it didn't work. We need to do, go something in another route. So it makes sense for us to scrap that. Okay. Anything else before I get into product design? Okay, by design. Cool. So by design, the way I like to think about it is, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to say this. Um, the way you, if you want to kind of sign up and keep in contact with us, um, we have a landing page. Just go on blog.venturepack.com slash event hyphen contact. And you can just like sign up and we can, if you want to be either get uh, ebooks from us, you can get the ebooks. The ebooks are free. Or if you just have any questions, you can just uh, email us at questions at venturepack.com. Just blog.venturepack.com slash event hyphen contacts. And then if you want to reach out to me, um, it's just linkedin.com slash in slash Randy Reyes, R-A-Y-E-S-S, or just email me Randy at venturepack.com. You, you can get it afterwards. I have business cards. Um, but in any case, the product design. How to think about product design. The first and most important thing about product design is when you think about habits. So what are the most popular products that you use on your phone today? Any, any suggestions? Google Maps. Airbnb. Airbnb. Uber. Uber. Twitter. Twitter. Calendar. Google, Google Calendar, Google Calendar, a bunch of calendars. Yeah. Safari. What's Safari, Safari, WhatsApp. What inbox? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So if you think about these apps, um, uh, you have you want to think a lot about if you're doing product design or thinking about product development, you want to think a lot about these apps. What's special about them? And there's a lot of things that these products do. They're very subtle that can really change the way you behave um, in ways that you, don't, you aren't aware of. So let's look at uh, tools like social tools. Okay, so Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, okay. So what does Facebook do to get you like, on the platform? And so Facebook has a goal, right? Facebook's goal is whenever you have free time, open Facebook, right? And they're trying to create that as a habit. You don't even think, you don't even question, should I go out, play basketball, should I do this? Just open Facebook. And that's kind of like the habit, like whenever you're bored, you have, you have time to waste. Go on Facebook. What things do they do to um, get you in that kind of hole or get you into that habit? Newsfeed. Newsfeed, yeah? Um, just like the email updates if you don't turn them off. Right. Yeah? Messenger. Messenger, yeah? So, a few things. Um, one thing they did was in, a few years ago, they moved the logout button from a logout button on the top right to a drop down and then the logout button. So just harder for you two clicks now to log out. So they want to make they want you first to always be logged in whenever you're browsing. Second thing they did, the the uh, if you guys notice that they have those three the friends, messages, and notifications. When you look at the way those notifications come up, they come up in a dark red coming out with a white in the button and the the earth or whatever picture is coming come out in this white image. That complexity in that the thought they put behind that is amazing. If you change that color to anything else, you actually don't even pay attention to it. There's a Chrome extensions that change it to gray. You don't even notice. You don't even click on those notifications. That red is just playing with your brain. You're like forcing to click on it. Oh my God, there's a notification. And you click on it, it's like some random person liked something. And, but they, they just do that to rethink your brain. They just completely are playing with your brain, but they're trying to make it a habit for you to just, come on, habits. A habit is notifications, messages, friend requests. Then you come, then they have the autoplay on video. You're scrolling and videos just start playing. And they keep it on mute because they don't want to completely annoy you. But as the video is played, it starts to become more engaging. And so you start watching. And so they're creating this habit. Okay, uh, this is interesting. Let me check it out because now it's being played. So can you clarify what you mean by the, by the red and the, and the notification? The no you know how the notification comes out? You, you know that shade of red? It's like a bright red that comes out on Facebook. Not quite sure where, where you're referring to. Okay, so if you're if you open Facebook.com, 
Yeah. And I'd say I just sent you, I posted on your wall. Yeah. So you'll have a notification. So on the top right, you'll see the earth. Yeah. Uh, and the earth will light up in white. The earth logo. Got it. Okay. And there's a red that's coming out. That red, that color of red that comes out where it says one or whatever, 15, is, is optimized for your mind, to get your mind excited to click on it. The same way Google experiment, experiment with, with, I believe, over 80 shades of blue on that search box. So that search box is like optimized for people to click on that search box. And I mean, obviously, Google has billions of people a day on their site, so they can optimize it very quickly uh, and get that blue. But they're trying to create these habits. And so great products are, uh, are thinking a lot about how can we get people engaged and how can we create habits. Um, LinkedIn does a lot of things about like, we want to be your home for professional, uh, uh, for everything professional. And they realized that while they had a lot of people and a great network, that without business content, um, you were, they were linking you to Business Insider, they were linking you to all these great business content, Bloomberg, Business Week, Wall Street Journal, outside of LinkedIn. But they realized they needed to be the home for this content, and so they created the publishing platform. They launched it in a very genius and, and intelligent way, they, they had the influencer program, and they started to create this kind of, oh, I can hire people on LinkedIn, I can find business on LinkedIn, I can uh, see what my, friend, my, my, my network is doing on LinkedIn, and I can read amazing content on LinkedIn. So now really they're trying to come full circle on business content. And so these, these habits I think are very important, and a lot of times when people build products, they don't realize that subtle differences completely change the experience and how people behave. Um, and so those are, those are a few things in product design that are very important. Um, so within, within specific products that you guys mentioned and what they do, so let's look at, let's look at those, uh, those products. So uh, Twitter, someone mentioned Twitter. So what Twitter does a really good job at is they've basically been able to, they do the same thing with the notifications on, on each, you know, each uh, thing. And then they, tr they try to do a, a few things now that are, are very intelligent. So they see what I'm, current, what I'm favoriting, usually, and then they'll say, oh, this is what you missed, right? Because you'll miss, like, the difference between, in Twitter, the feeds keep, keeps running, so you miss things. So they're, they're trying to be smart, this is what you've missed, you know? YouTube says, this is what we recommend, right? And not only do they recommend feature, they now have the auto play feature. So they'll auto play the next episode that's most likely for you to see and they kind of bring you it. Uh, any questions about product design? I can go on forever about the specific products and you know if you guys want to talk go through a deep dive on like Snapchat or Uber or WhatsApp, we can do that. But what are any questions on product design? Yeah. So when you have your MVP and you go out and test it with the customer, right? How do you structure focus groups like to accurately get things that you repeat into your equipment, like your next iteration. Yeah, okay. So we've seen uh, many different things here, some actually very smart, uh, some good experiments, but we, we always think about experimenting with <coughs> different initiatives. So the first thing is, of course, intelligent A-B testing. So you want to A-B test different messaging, you want to A-B test different colors, and you even want to A-B test uh, different flows, and how, how, how funnels are, are, are working. And so you kind of look at the funnel, you see bounce rates across the funnel, and how can you optimize the leakage that's happening. Um, so a few things that are intelligent about how to, how to go about doing that. One thing you can do is uh, you can use different tools like Intercom, OLARC, etc., that allow people uh, to comment, to chat with you during the process. So you kind of come up and you, you, you can speak, they can speak with you. Uh, Intercom is, a, fat, is a, a very powerful tool for that. Another thing you can do is uh, you can have a button on the top right. There's a constant button where you can have feedback or it comes out as a pop-up and you can have feedback and you can just type there. But another thing you can do is you can actually have a place for them to go um, to actually, um, uh, to basically provide feedback in a Reddit-like community. So what would happen is every customer would come in and put their feedback, and people can upvote and downvote that feedback. So it's kind of like a Reddit poll. And it's really powerful because you can start to see if other people agree with it, as opposed to, is it to just one person's idea. And so uh, that's something very interesting. Xiaomi does this like, uh, as their entire product roadmap is built from this community of customers that's based on like a Reddit-like uh, experience. Um, something we, we've done is we have, um, so we have a forum.venturepack.com, so people just uh, post questions there and ask for, I have feedback there. 
So usually when we give presentations, you guys can do this too. If you want, if you have a question, you just post it to forum.venturepack.com, and we either answer it or like I'll put it up at the end of the presentation, and I'll answer it there. And what it does is it tells us, oh, what are common questions people have uh, about outsourcing, about our product, what are challenges they face, and we can start to see how can we pre, uh, you know, given that problem, how can we pre-structure to think about structuring the product in such a way to protect against that problem happening again. So there's things we can do there. Um, to, to be intelligent about it. Good question. Anything else product design? Okay. Yeah. yeah I guess, how do you guys prioritize? Because I'm sure you get a lot of comments from different folks versus what you guys feel like is within your, uh, you know, the things you'd rather work on or things that you think would be more valuable to your current customers or the folks you want to target. So what's your method for prioritizing these oh. features over others? That is the, that is the like, you know, big question. Um, so what you start to see, especially if you're a social product where you're consumer facing, you just have so many consumers, right? Each consumer has a hundred different ideas and you have to say, okay, what matters to us? Like what is our vision? And when you want to understand your vision, that's going to be the key. So Reid Hoffman famously talks about like when they were starting LinkedIn, everyone was like, yo, check out MySpace. MySpace is scaling at social. It'd be super useful because I have my business people there. I can add social there. Oh, and then Zynga came and you know, Pinkus is friends with Hoffman and Pinkus was like, hey, can you hook us up on the side with Zynga stuff? And all these great ideas, right? And they seemed short term valuable. They would definitely have gotten a spike in usage if they had social and they like uh, consumer social versus business social and they had social gaming. But you realize that wasn't aligned with their vision, you know? And so their vision is to be your professional network. Uh, their, their vision is to be business, the business for the business and focus on that. And so, because they knew that all these feature requests, they, they ignored. And so, first you have to understand what you're running after, and second you have to think about how big of a pain point is this, right? So, clear things that are, are causing leakage in your funnel, like those are the first things you're going to protect against, because you just don't want, like if a consumer is confused landing on something, you're experimenting with Google AdWords, and you see that messages are working better than others, those are like first things you're going to be working on. After that, then it comes like a, an opinion-based thing. So it's like, okay, this person said that if we add this feature, it would make some XYZ better off, or it would do this better. Uh, what, there's a really good way, to, the way we like to think about it, is we say there's a few, there's different types of feedback. There's feedback from existing customers, existing paid customers. There's feedback from uh, people who are in your, um, in your like addressable market, people who are potential future customers, but aren't current customers. And there's feedback from people who are not even thinking about using your site because of some reason. And so when you think of those three types of people, it, depending on your goal, uh, you, 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 know, you can think a lot about the person who's like not willing to use your site. Why aren't they willing to use your site? Is it because it's too long? Is it because of trust? Is it because they want to speak with someone on the phone and don't want to use your site? You know, and then you can think about how can we structure our products for that? Um, if it's, um, if it's someone who's currently on your site and you're engaging with it, right? He's engaging with your content but doesn't want to transact, how, wh what's their feedback? And the third is the person who's buying. Now the person who's buying is gonna have a lot of feedback because they're using your product, but some of their suggestions are gonna be very unique to them. I'll give you an example. So on our product, you'll have, um, we have like an escrow payment funnel. So company comes in, wants to transact. Uh, they separate the product into milestones. And they'll say, let's say the product is going to take six milestones, and each milestone is, let's say, a two-week two -week milestone. So the way the escrow payment system works is you fund the account at the beginning. At the end of the two weeks, uh, that money is deposited as long as what was agreed to at the beginning of the milestone is achieved. And it keeps on going like that. Now, we've had a few customers come in, and they've had very specific requests where they're like, okay, we have this milestone, okay, this two-week milestone or one-month milestone, but at the end, we want to be able to add in changes during a milestone because our product isn't well defined, right? And we'll be like, actually, we're not gonna build a feature for in milestone changes because it's not in your best interest to, build, to change requests within a milestone. You should be sprint, the sprint is, you shouldn't absorb changes during the sprint. At the end of the sprint, you then incorporate a change request. So we didn't have a feature where you can book, uh, to add in change requests mid milestone because it's not in their best interest. But we got a few customers who are asking for this. 
And uh, so we have to think about like, okay, you got a few customers asking for this. Is that in their best interest? And does it make sense for them? Even though in their minds, they think, oh, we should incorporate, uh, we want to be able to take any change and like completely, as, you know, as soon as, we, as soon as we think of a change, put it in, um, they don't realize that from a workflow management for software development, that's not the right way to do it. And so we have to guide companies in that way too. So long answer, not an easy question. Um, but really, you want to think about your vision. Like, what is the vision of the company and what you're trying to achieve? And then once you know that, then you're able to better uh, handle, handle requests and prioritize requests. And of course, the Reddit thing is amazing because you can see how many customers have this problem. If you get a thousand upvotes uh, and it's the number one upvote, then it's like, oh wow, this is a huge problem. But Reddit doesn't do that. What tool do you guys use for that? Oh, so we build, we have our, a few, so if you, like, we have our own tool you where you just upload, yeah. Yeah. So it basically just, Reddit has upload downvote thing. It's the right. same Reddit-like uh, UI, yeah. but it's our home. So you, you build it. Yeah, yeah, we build it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you just upload downvote, and you can get, and you have to make it obviously accessible for people to do that, and then they can upload downvote. On our forum, like, people just ask questions, and they can say, like, oh, uh, you know, we get a lot of questions about, like, um, we have, we, we put them into buckets now. And you can see, like, okay, there's a lot of questions around what does this jargon stuff mean? Like, what is SOW or uh, how do I think about, like, what is statement of work? Right? How do I think about that? How do I structure statement of work? How do I write specs? Common questions. So we have those common questions. And now when people come on there, it serves actually a few purposes. One is you can see other requests people have and they'll say, oh, I never thought about that. That's going to be useful. The second thing is you start to, the questions that people already have, they can get straight up. So if you had that same question, you don't have to ask us on intercom that question. You just see it on the form and you say, oh, I got the answer straight away. So that, that doesn't require us as much bandwidth. And that ties in with knowledge management, also inside companies. Um, so yeah, I don't, I can go on a while for knowledge management, but one of the key, one of the big problems with, with uh, knowledge management in companies is, uh, is how do I manage knowledge between teams? And so if I have a remote team, and I'm a company here, and I have, let's say, four developers in-house, and those four developers have this external dev team that's remote. How do I manage knowledge between those teams? Um, and so the way you want to do that intelligently is by creating a searchable, accessible interface as opposed to one-on-one -on -one emails that requires only one person to answer the question, and that question is only answered for that one person, so any future person doesn't have access to it. You know, that's what Slack has been championing a lot of that concept is how do we better manage knowledge? Uh, and they've created this amazing search interface and a great marketing company. Okay, anything else in product design? If you guys, yeah. There's like um, consumer input CPG companies do this practice where they create groups that stay with them over a period of time and they appear to, like they appear to a particular type of product or demographic and then they constantly test like variations in specs with this same group of people. Have you seen anything like that? Oh, that yeah. And what's amazing is the software, it's a lot easier to do that. So uh, the way we do A-B testing is uh, we, okay, I studied statistics and I'm like a little uh, obsessive, I'm obsessive about how we think about A-B testing. I'll give you the basics around it. What you want to do is you want to think about, over time, you want to come up with a very smart kind of metrics around how, at what point, do you kill a campaign or kill a test and optimize on another one. So if you think about a, a, a test, we have a test of our uh, key call to action on page one. So we have that key test, and we experiment with call to action one versus call to action two. Let's say call to action one says, click here. Call to action two says, get in development, whatever. Test, test, test. And then you say, okay, after X number of impressions and views and clicks, we're gonna take, if, if uh, on one basis, we're going to choose the better one and kill the other one. And then we're going to stick on that branch and we're going to further subdivide that into two A-B tests. So you can start thinking about how that would, how that would funnel it. And then um, the key thing, of course, is you, wanna, you don't want to change too many variables. You can only change one variable to do a proper A-B test. So if I change the color of the button and the text on the button, then I don't have a good understanding of what caused the change. Uh, so you have to be smart about how you do A-B testing. But, a-B testing is very important. Um, cool. All right. And if there's any other questions, you can ask on forum.mentorite.com, but I'll, okay, fine, I'll take this one. Just one, one quick silly, uh, I guess, question is, uh, does it have to just be A-B? So, I mean, if 
for instance, could you test like multiple colors at one time? Yeah. Or is it? Yeah, exactly. Yes, of course. So basically, the way it works is you're gonna say, I know, like, the current site has been working in this way. So we're gonna direct 60% of our traffic to the way the current site works. And then we're going to take the other 40% of the traffic and we're going to play around with them. We're going to try, you know, one person this sees this, one person sees that, one person. You can do multiple ABCD lessons. But again, you're changing one variable. So you can change the button from green, red, yellow, blue. But then you're going to do that on segments of the traffic. Last, uh, last question is what, what kind of benchmarks in terms of traffic do you typically use or do you, do you see as, as being considered a valid test? I mean, is 30 enough samples or is it, are we talking like 30,000? Yeah, um, that depends. That, that, that is a problem that will, that is a question that varies based on the type of company. So the way Facebook runs tests is very different from the way Startup X runs tests. Facebook has approximately 1.4 billion monthly actives. Um, so for them, uh, running a test on a billion people is, 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 is uh, kind of something they can do. And most startups do not have a billion actives. Um, actually, very few companies have a billion actives. It's like Facebook. YouTube, close to a billion, and then like Google. So there's very few companies um, that have that uh, privilege. In any case, um, the way I would think about it is you, over time, once you do a lot of things, you'll be able to figure it out. But if you have 50 clicks on something and you're testing a landing page, um, within 50 clicks, if you have no conversions and like poor engagement, you can kind of tell that it's not a good landing page. Uh, but that's kind of like a rough, Number, 25 to 50, you want at least just to get it, test them out. Um, but yeah, once you get to 100 and more, you start to see, you start to be able to really see, okay, you've got 100 here and 100 here, and you can start to see things a lot more clearer. Um, and if you, it really depends on your confidence level, right? So if I want 95% confidence, then uh, that's going to require a lot more um, N, ex ex like, what's it, a lot more uh, uh, clicks, sample. yeah, sample, uh, versus if I want like a 75 or 90 percent confidence interval. Um, so the more the more confidence you want, the the more and you're going to need. So you kind of come up with these heuristics as you go along and uh, optimize. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So the third thing I was going to typically talk about is a bit about how we, uh, what we're thinking of, what we do, and how we think about things. Um, so the way we think about ourselves is. Um, you know, a lot of people ask us, like, say what you do in three words. And uh, that was very hard for us to do because uh, I think what we do is very interesting and it takes me a lot longer than three words to describe it. But if I had to do it in three words, what we kind of think about it is we say, you, we are your development team. Whoever you are, uh, we are your development team. And so we say, and the reason we say that is we think about it in the way that if you are, like, the, in a marketing team uh, in a big company, or if you're a startup uh, and you're building something, or if you're, like, a CIO or a CTO or whatever you are, um, I think there's a lot of things people can do if they uh, understand how technology, what problems they're facing, and they think about what they're doing that's repetitive. They understand how technology can solve those problems, and if they have access to the right technical talent to address and, uh, and implement that problem. And so we said, okay, if we can do that intelligent, if we can do that in a good way, then we can empower people, and we can be kind of their development team in a, in a good way. So that's how we think about what we do, and um, that's been what we focus on. And we have gotten requests, um, as was Tom and said, that's where we've gotten requests for people to say, can you add on for me legal services or marketing services? We haven't done that yet because we're focused on software. And, uh, and that's, that's another thing that we say. Like, we want, we want currently, let's focus on software development and get this down and get it done well. And to do that well, that means that we have to travel and meet these developers. And so we, what we spent our time doing is going around the US, going around Europe, going around Middle East, going around Southeast Asia, and just kind of meeting deaf teams and seeing kind of what, what are they doing, and learning about their history, learning about their, their education system, and you know, different talent, and different uh, schooling systems, uh, train people for very different things. And um, you know, so you, you, we want to understand what, is, what are these schools kind of training people for? And we see a lot of these problems, we'll meet with these schools, and we say, wait, you guys are great, but you're training everyone in Java, and you're getting these great Java developers, but like the world has changed. And then they'll tell us, you're right, um, and, but who, okay, you want me to teach them Ruby, and you want me to teach them Node, and you want me to teach them Angular, but where do we get professors, right? And so then we'll be like, well, maybe you don't need to get professors, maybe you need to get just talented developers to train them. 
But then, there, then there's this common problem of like, well, if we're getting just, you know, people in their 20s and 30s, they don't have PhDs to teach, then that dilutes our brand as a, as a, as a top tier university. And so these top tier universities end up actually sacrificing the, the quality, of their, quality of their education is not as modern as, modern, uh, as other schools because they're, they're scared about uh, allowing people to, you know, to, get, to get trained. So, um, so we said, okay, you guys should do workshops and classes and things that are not considered for credit, at least to start off with, to protect your brand, but at least educate your students, and that helps you kind of guide things. But in any case, uh, uh, that's one of the things we spent our time doing, is how can we find the best tech teams, how can we vet them efficiently, uh, meet them, and then connect them with the right companies. And if we can do that, uh, and we can make that a great experience, then we can be the habit we're trying to create, the habit we think about is someone needs a developer, someone has that need, we want them to just get onto our site and say, I need iOS developer with experience in healthcare in Eastern Europe, search, or just iOS developer, whatever they want to do. We just want them to kind of go into a system and pull the search and just keep doing it. So that's the habit that we try to think about and how can we optimize for it. Um, any questions about venture pack and what we do? Just a question on the location. <clears throat> can you talk a little bit more about why somebody would uh, specify Eastern Europe? Like, uh, aside from the time zone situation, which makes a lot of sense, but what about somebody in Bulgaria actually makes them better than somebody in Pakistan? Or Great Pakistan? question. Great question. Um, so there's a few things that come into play. Number one, it's just horror stories. So people have heard horror stories about specific developers that they suddenly apply and generalize to a whole country. So they say, I'm not going to touch this country, which is a little crazy. It's like if I was to hire a developer in the US, uh, and it doesn't work out, that makes me say, like, I'm never going to hire US developers again, but people do that when they're interacting with people not, that they haven't, they haven't exposed in any case. Um, so that's one reason why people do that. They just, they have a negative uh, stigma against it. The second reason why people would say a different country is, they'll be like, okay, I have a cost, uh, uh, especially startups, they'll have like, I have a limitation based on cost. Like, I cannot afford a San Francisco developer. I need someone in the Midwest, or I need someone in South America or Eastern Europe because the cost of living is lower, so I can get good talent at a lower price. The other reason why people would do it is they'll say, people will say, okay, I need someone in South America because I have a family and I'm not available in the evening. So I'm only available during this specific hour on the working day, and South America is in the same time zone, so I gotta stick with South America. Mm -hmm. Another thing people will say is like, okay, I'm hiring a QA team to, quality, to do quality assurance, and to manage our customer tickets. Um, and I want to be able to do 24 hour service. So if I can get someone in Southeast Asia, I get that 10 and a half hour lag. So they can work during their daytime and I can still provide 24 hour service because I'm working during my daytime, they're providing their daytime. So you put eight hours and eight hours and you suddenly get 16 hours of service because they're back to back. As opposed to uh, having to do all of that in the US and you have people working graveyard shifts. So you can do smart things about getting that 24 hour clock in place. Um, with Southeast Asia. The other thing is uh, specific countries have a better English skill sets and Eng English training. So uh, Romania and, and Bulgaria and, and those, these countries have a reasonably solid kind of English, as you, as you kind of grow up, you know, English is part of the system. People study English, so that's great. Um, whereas other countries, English might not be as part of the, as part of the education system. I don't, I, I hate generalizing saying whole countries, but, um, but like, I just kind of take that with a grain of salt. Like, more or less, you start to, you have, you have a lot of solid schools in those countries that do have good English training and good technical training. And so that's why you start to see, okay, there's good English, good technical training, and it's um, low cost of living, because those are Eastern European markets, they, they just tend to have lower cost of living. So then you can get value, value, for, value for money. So those are a few things that you can think about when you think of time zone. Um, and, uh, and the other challenge, if you think about Eastern Europe versus Southeast Asia, is um, Eastern Europe is seven hours ahead, Southeast Asia is around 10, hour, 10 and a half hours ahead. So it's seven hours ahead of Eastern, um, nine to 11 Eastern time zone, they'll, they're still at work. Whereas if it's 10 and a half hours ahead, uh, at 9 a.m. Eastern, it's 7.30 p.m. over there, so that overlap isn't as nice. So it does force you when you do Southeast Asia for one side to work later. Um, so that's an issue, or like much earlier. So that's a disadvantage, or an advantage, depending on your preferences. 
Uh, what about um, export control act considerations? Um, I don't know if it applies to software, but you know there's restrictions on technology. Yeah. If you know, export to certain countries. Yeah. Great question. Okay. Um, so there's two parts to, to to how we think about this. The first part is the actual ownership of the IP that is the code that you're writing and how, where that's produced and how that's owned. And the second part is the data. So if you look at think about companies, um, it's a great problem to have, but if you're a startup and you have like two million customers, um, all, and all their credit card information is on your site, uh, any, any developer's access to that data is actually, that's actually very powerful. They have emails and, and well, if you have two million customers, then you're, you're probably a big company, uh, paying customers with credit card information. But even if you just have two million emails, um, there's this whole concept of like how do we keep the data secure and how do we give people access, developers access to this. Um, and this problem is uh, much a bigger problem, as I said, is credit card data and patient data in healthcare. In healthcare, there's actually like HIPAA compliance, which is like government regulation. What you do there and what we've done with healthcare there is that you actually, the data cannot leave, it's, it's basically like not allowed for the data to leave the US for healthcare law. For, for, for HIPAA, uh, against, it's against HIPAA. So what you would do is you would keep the data hosted in the US and the, the, the developers there will basically talk to the data. So they're not actually accessing or, or uh, have the, the full data set. They can just work, build code on top of the data set without actually uh, working on it. So you have to be smart about how you do the data. Uh, that's one part of it. And then the IP part, obviously that's part of the contract. So what we do is we have like guidelines for contracts when you're signing. So uh, within the escrow system, there's the milestone and then there's the ownership code. So depending on where, what you're using, let's say you're using GitHub, where you're writing the code and you're doing version control. The, on, on GitHub, there is, uh, you can, if you do it on the client GitHub, right, then the client has, always has access to the code and the client kind of owns the code, uh, but you want to make sure that it's very well detailed in the IP clause in the contract. So that's important, very important. Contract writing for software agreements is extremely, is a very important part of it. Um, otherwise, you start to you you have potential problems around like well, who, when do I own the code? How does it? How does uh, delivery of code work versus payment timeline? Um, and one of the things we saw was that escrow was so important because it created an environment of trust. The development team knew they were going to pay if they delivered because the money was in escrow, and the client knew that they weren't going to run away with the money unless they actually delivered. So escrow helps bring in a lot of trust, and you can allow it can help manage a lot of this like oh when is it owned versus when is it paid. And it's like, wait, you send me the code first, and then I send you the, I own the code, and then I send you money, you send money, and then I own the code, how does that work? And you get these kind of things like that. So you want to be careful.